All right, so um, I, I said to you last week that I was going to speak to um, leading today, but uh, for whatever reason, I don't think that is the direction God wants us to go today. So I'm going to speak to you on something else. Hallelujah. But just trust that it's the will of God for us to go in this direction. Amen. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 8. That's where we're going. Second Corinthians, we're going to read some part of chapter 8. All right. Moreover, brethren, that's one now. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. We do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. In my notes, I actually use NIV. So, <laughs> Uh, so, so you know sometimes KJV can be so complicated. We do you we <laughs> look at it. We do you to wit. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> but in New, New International Version it says, "And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has, has given the Macedonian churches." Do you see? I want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Now, uh, so this is, this is not the key verse that we are going to study, but I just want you to see the example that we are going to study. So I'm going to speak to you on service. The Macedonian example. I don't know where that title came from. In my note, there is no title. <laughs> Service. The Macedonian example. And now, br brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. You see that now? Now, he's writing to the Corinthians. And he says to them, I want you to know the grace of God that is evident in the churches at Macedonia. Do you see that now? So, whatever he's about to say concerning the Macedonian churches would be a good example for the Corinthians to follow. Are you following what I'm saying? So, could we also say whatever it is about these Macedonian churches would be a good example for us today to also follow? Are you following what I'm saying? Okay. So the example of the Macedonian church or churches, you know, is an intriguing one. And it should never fail to intrigue any one of us. Because if you read the full passage, you know, in fact, if you go to verse 2, Paul says, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Are you still here? Look at it. Does this seem like a church that had it all? Eh? Look at it. They had what he called the, a great trial. Of affliction. But. Abound, abundance of joy. Do you see? What a contradiction. People that are suffering affliction. Should ordinarily. Lack joy. In their lives. But these ones. They had a great abundance of. Um, affliction. But there was joy in their lives. And then look at the next thing. And their deep poverty. <laughs> it, it, it didn't just, you know, when you begin to qualify, you know, their state, 
You know, to say they are, they, they are in poverty is enough. But he says, in deep poverty. Deep poverty. But look at it, another contradiction. In that deep poverty, what did we see? The riches of their liberality. Can you see that now? They were, a, they were a giving church even though they were a very poor church. Are you following what I'm saying? In affliction, but a rejoicing church. A, a contradiction. They were steep in deep poverty, yet a very liberal church, a giving church. Do you see that now? And you see, you would only be able to contextualize this when you cite this church in the history of Paul's ministry. The Philippian church is an example of the Macedonian church. And then if you go to Philippians chapter 4, Paul told the Philippians, like I said, they were part of the Macedonian church. And he said to them that when he, he set out into, in, in, on his ministry journeys, he said no church communicated to, with him in giving and receiving. And this is not about money. You understand what I'm saying? It's not about money. Now, no church communicated with him except the Macedonians. So, you will think that, oh, the reason they communicated with him it was because they had all. So, Paul says to the Corinthians, it wasn't a case of having anything. They did not have, they were steep in deep poverty. Yet, they showed a lot of liberality in their giving and support for the work of ministry that Paul conducted. See that now. So, this is a church that we should all study. How come these contradictions was present there? Good contradictions, to say, so to say. Uh, affliction, but a joyful church. In the middle of affliction, yet a joyful church. You see, in deep poverty, yet a giving church. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, you know, to serve the Lord is not, has nothing to do with the substance that you have, resources that you are blessed with, and all the, No, 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 no. These people did not have it, but they served. Are you following what I'm saying? They did not have all these things, but they served. You know. So, let's go to the actual verse I want to show you. Same chapter, verse 5. Or we can just read the sequence. Verse 3 now. For to their power I bear record. Yeah, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. Can you see that now? See, to their power, I bear record. That is, what they did for me concerning the work of ministry that I was embarking on, look at it. It says, to their power. In fact, it says, beyond their power. In other words, these people went above and beyond what they were capable of doing. They sacrificed everything that they had just to see that the work of God in the hand of Paul succeeded. Can you see? So Paul said, they went beyond their power. They exhausted their means. They did everything they could just to reach out to Paul and support what he was doing. Look at verse 5. And these they did, not as we hoped. Not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. He said, it was not anything I could have hoped for. What they did was not anything I could have hoped for. Look at it. He says, 
But first, they gave themselves to the Lord. Now, you know, we had, I mentioned it some weeks ago when we spoke about giving your life to the Lord, right? And I said, that expression, giving your life to the Lord, more, you know, is better applied to your consecration to the Lord rather than to your salvation. Because there is nothing that you are giving to the Lord in salvation. It is you rather accepting his life. You see. You see that now. So, at salvation, you did not give your life to the Lord. What you did is to, was to accept his own life for your own. That's why the Bible says that our life is hid in Christ, in God. The life that we have today is not ours anymore. It is that has been given to us. Now, these people did not give their life to God for salvation. They already did. But now, he says, they gave themselves first to the Lord. And if somebody serves the Lord, I mean, are we not all expected to serve the Lord? Every one of us is expected to serve the Lord. So that is not a big deal, right? That is the point of your salvation, to serve him. But, you know, it is important because everything builds up from there. If, 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 there, if, you, if you have not devoted your life to, to serve the Lord, <laughs> what else can you even do for him? You see. So these people, so why were they able to give out of their deep poverty? Because they were surrendered to the Lord. Do you see that now? He said, it was beyond what we hoped for. Because these people had given themselves to the Lord. They gave themselves to the Lord. And that is not just all. Look at the next statement. And unto us by the will of God. Unto us. Unto Paul. So, they, their devotion was to God in Christ and to Paul in his work of ministry for the Lord. Are you following what I'm saying now? So they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God unto Paul. This, this is the Macedonian example. And you know, we, we as Christians today, if it is good enough for the Corinthian Christians as example, it is good enough for us. See, we as Christians ought to know that it is, you see, that your claim to serve the Lord is seen in your devotion to serving men. You cannot serve your church, but you claim to serve the Lord. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Your service to the Lord is seen in your service in the church. And the Macedonian churches, of course, definite Christian assemblies, because I believe that there were several churches that made up the Macedonian church. The Philippian church, for instance, was one of them. Okay? One of the communities that made up Macedonia. You see that? Now? So there were several churches. So, definitely, these are assembly of believers because they believe. They confess Jesus as Lord and then it, it, was, it was so certain because if you read the beginning of Corinthians, it, it was very clear that Paul brought the gospel to the Corinthians. Do you see that now? And you could infer that he did the same to the Macedonians. If you read in the book of Acts of Apostles. So, he served as the apostle over this ministry. Now, these people not resting on the fact that they just believe they have believed the Lord, glory be to Jesus, they are saved, eternal life was, is already theirs, they, they are walking in, in, you know, in the truth of salvation that is in Christ Jesus, but it didn't stop there. They took their faith in Christ seriously. And as Paul would testify, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord. So it wasn't just a matter of I am saved, eternally saved, Nothing is shaking me. Nothing is removing me out of his hands. Glory be to Jesus. I'm eternally saved. Yes, that is good. That's the beginning. 
But then they proceeded to give themselves over to the service of the Lord. They surrendered. They consecrated themselves for the work of God. And that's why the Bible tells us that they had great, a great affliction they suffered. They suffered a great affliction. Now, why will you suffer affliction? It is because you are not identified with the world. You see that now? You are persecuted for your faith in Christ. Persecuted for your faith in Christ. Look at it. And, like I told you, their consecration to the Lord is in no way describing salvation. It is pointing at their consecration. You see. They do not just believe the Lord for their salvation. They did, but that is not all. They devoted their lives to serving him, including with their time and other resources. And if you read the chapter to the end, including their money. You see that now? Because Paul practically and particularly described their deep poverty and their liberality. They were poor, but they gave. They gave to support Paul's work in the ministry. Hallelujah. All right, so now, and not just that, they gave themselves by the will of God, as Paul will indicate also to us. Look at it. Verse 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own, their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. Now, don't gloss over it. And unto us. So, their consecration was not just to the Lord, it was also to Paul. Are you following what I'm saying? So, would, I would not be an heretic, right? If I also say, That, that your belief and devotion to the Lord, right, should also transfer to, into your service of the local church and your pastor. Are you following what I'm saying? What I'm saying is this, that I want you to know that it is not heretic for me to ask you to believe and devote yourself to this church and to me in addition to believing in the Lord Jesus. Why would that be so? We'll come there. Now, <laughs> of course, you know that believing in me cannot get you saved, right? Eh? Only faith in Christ Jesus saves anyone. Right? But it will demonstrate your trust in the growing grace of God upon my life. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you still here? Uh-huh. That, you know, you can't just, you can't just, uh, 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 you know, the, the, um, this is apostolic practice. Are you following what I'm saying now? Apostolic practice. The church, this church, the Macedonian churches, devoted their lives to the Lord to serve him with all their resources and not just the Lord they devoted the same to the minister of God that God has set over them. And I'm asking you, I'm asking of you the same this morning. And one thing is certain. God did not call any of us to individual work with him. He did not call any of us to individual work with him. So you are not meant for a solitary walk. God may have called us individually, but sets up 
sets us up in a family for our spiritual nourishment and growth. So in Psalm 68 verse 6, the Bible says, God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. You see, he sets the lonely in families. This is the work of God. When you are saved, the next work of God that is done in your life is that he plants you in a family. What does he do? He plants you in a family. And for us as believers, that is the church. And I believe that I did not stumble on you. And I also believe that you did not stumble on me. Do you follow what I'm saying? For every one of you, God brought you here. Every one of you, every single one of you, God brought you here. Your coming here was an orchestration of God. Was God working in your life to bring you to the family where he wants you to belong? And I believe meeting each one of you was an orchestrated move of God. I believe it with all my heart. That it is the work of God that God has done. You know, uh, you know sometimes 68 verse 6. 68 verse 6. So, so I'm moving between NIV and KJV because if you notice, I'm switching in between. Now, so, uh, so I believe that you're coming, meeting you is an orchestrated move of God. You know, and sometimes it might just be circumstance, it might appear circumstantial, like, oh, circumstances happened and then we met somehow. But God, using circumstances for us to meet, is just his, his way of doing his work anonymously. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, God can do something and not sign it. You see, that is, you know, he did it anonymously because he did not, because it wasn't obvious, because, you know, it seemed like it was too coincidental, but it is not. You know, it, it is not. God is not a, God is not, our God is not a happenstance. Do you get what I'm saying? Our God is not what? A happenstance. He just, he, things doesn't roll on and he, he's figuring things out as they come along. No, the, God doesn't work that way. More so, the work of God to perfect your work, your work with him, is done by the church, in the church. So, if God will perfect the work of a man, a Christian, he puts him in a church for his own nourishment, for his spiritual nourishment and growth. So, that work that is done by the church, in the church, is for his own well-being. For the well-being of everyone that God has put in that church. And that is why I believe God brought you here to be nourished into growth. Now, to the church of God, God gave men. <laughs> In my note, I said imperfect men. God gave imperfect men to do that work of spiritual nourishment and growth. Because, you know, <laughs> if if these people devoted themselves to the Lord and devoted themselves to Paul, I mean, devoted themselves to a man, didn't they realize he is a man or he was a man? They knew. They knew. Right? But that is how God functions. He works with men. So, he made men shepherd over his own heritage. He gave men to shepherd his bride and to nourish them with the word of, of life. 
Look at it. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read from verse 8. Look at it. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Is that in your Bible? He gave gifts unto men. I, I, I wrote my notes actually in NIV. So look at what NIV says. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Who did he give the gift to? His people. Who are his people? If you read the context of the passage, it is the church. Are you following what I'm saying? He gave gifts to the church. What did he give? What did he give? Jump to verse 11. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Pastors are teachers, okay? Pastors are teachers. If you notice, they were not separate. Here, they are not separated. And if you look at the manner of their separation, it is very clear that the intention is not to separate pastors and teachers. Look at it. And some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists. Then the next and some says pastors and teachers. Do you see that now? So the intention is not to separate them, okay? And then, you know, sometimes, you know, because sometimes we wonder, you know, when, when people say, you know, we have this idea that an evangelist place is not in the church, it's outside the church. But look at it. Who did God give these people to? His people. He gave them to the people. So where is their ministry? In the church. Are you following what I'm saying? Look at the next one. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Look at verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So if you, if you put verse 8... And verse 11 together, this is how it will read. I'm reading from NIV now. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. This is Adam. The pastors and teachers. So the gift he gave to his people are who? The, the, the prophets, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Do you see that now? Eh? So you could say in, in, in the church of God, there are two broad categories of gifts that are preached in the church. The gift of the Spirit, right? Where you have the utterance gift, the, the revelation gift, and the power gift, right? As you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then the second kind of the second kind of gift, the ministry gifts, the apostle, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, all these gifts functions where in the church? Do you see that now? Now, the first gift, the gift of the spirit, is given to individual members of the church, right? But the ministry gift here in Ephesians chapter 4 is given to the collective body. Are you following what I'm saying? Uh, so, your pastor is not a personal tool. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your pastor is the pastor of an assembly. Of course, there is a way in which you benefit from him personally. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. But it's a gift to the body. 
Do you see that now? A gift to God's people. And do you notice that um, it doesn't have to be just a pastor in a church or just one apostle? You know, all these gifts, all the four, the four groups can be present in a particular church. The four. There can be an apostle in, a, in an assembly, there can be prophets, there can be evangelists, there can be pastors. Do you see what I'm saying now? They can be there together and work together. Because their ministry is in the church and their work is cut out for them for the perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting is equipping. You know, I, and I, you know if you, in one of our previous lessons, I, I, I give you an example of um, a soldier, right? Who is going for an operation, not a drill, a life operation, and then he wears his kit, his uniform, and then on his uniform, he applies all the tools that he needs. You know, you see a, a soldier every day, practically every day. Maybe they walk by you, or you see them at parks, whatever. But you don't see them dressed like they, you see them when they are going for an operation. They have a lot more on their uniform when they are going for operations, because they want to go along with all the necessary equipment that they need, that they think they need to prosecute that, that operation. Or an astronaut who is going to wear his space kit because he's going to space. Do you see that now? So you kit up appropriately for the kind of activity you will be involved in. You see that now? So he says, the work of these ministers is to equip you for the activity of life in Christ. And your primary work as a believer is the work of ministry. To tell the world about Jesus. Your own world. The world around you about Jesus. <laughs> Do you understand this? Okay, let's go on. Hallelujah. Okay, so. God gave men as gifts. So. Devoting to the Lord and to those men is not out of place. They are God's representative. I, I, do you understand what I'm saying? Because God gave them a specific work to build up his church, to perfect his church, to prepare them for the work of ministry. In fact, there is a very good example in Acts chapter 20. This, this is also Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders, the same church we just read is a um, letter to them now. Um, I don't want to read everything, but look at verse 28. You can read it from 17, but I, I just want to go to verse 28. Take it therefore unto yourselves and to hold the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. Can you see? Take heed unto yourselves and to the flock of God. Look at it. It says, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To do what? To feed. To feed the church of God. The church of God. The church is the church of Jesus Christ. He purchased it with his own blood. Then he gave the church over to men to shepherd it. Look at it. It says, to feed the church. To feed the church. So if you go back to that Ephesians chapter 4, you see, the work becomes, you know, it becomes clearer to you. That it says, your job is to perfect them for the work of ministry. And how do you do that perfection? By teaching. You see that now? By teaching. So the work of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers is teaching. The evangelist is not the one that is just shouting on top of his voice, Repent! Give your life to Jesus! Mm -mm. That's not just his work. His work is in the church. Equipping the saints to carry out that work of the evangelist. Do you see that now? Uh -huh. 
So the evangelist trains us in the church to do the work of an evangelist. Do you see that now? A pastor will teach us, help us to be grounded in the truth of God's word so that we can be effective communicators of the gospel. So when Paul told Philemon that the communication of your faith becomes effectual, you see, he says, when you acknowledge the good things in you in Christ Jesus, in other words, the work of a pastor in his life will result to effective sharing of his faith. Do you understand that? The work of a pastor in his life will lead to effective sharing of his faith. The work of the pastor is not just to have you blessed, to have your needs met, to prosper in this life and have resources and then support the gospel. Mm -mm. He is to, if he has not failed in his work, it will include that you are developed, well developed, and you can in turn preach the gospel the same way he has communicated it to you. And if you are looking for that reference, it is Philemon verse 6. Philemon has only one chapter, verse 6. So, let me go back to my notes. Notice, God gave gifts to his people. What gifts? He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So, you are God's people, right? You are God's people, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Okay? That's what you are. And I am God's gift to you. Are you following me? You are God's people, and I am what? God's gift to you. And you see, this is the background on which I want to now say the rest of the things I want to share with you. You are God's people. I am God's gift to you. The minister over the church is God's gift to that church. And usually, he functions alongside other people. All those people are also what? Gifts to the church. Do you see that now? The Bible says, all these offices, Jesus Christ gave them as gifts to his church to nourish them. To nourish them. Hallelujah. And I am greatly determined functioning in the grace of God that I will always be a blessing to you. Always. But this is not about me. It's about you. So, <laughs> I, 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 of course, I, I'm saying my own commitment, but you, where is your own commitment? Where is yours? Where is yours? Like I said, I am greatly determined that functioning in the grace of God, I will be that blessing to you. The way that Christ has intended for it to be, I will be to you. That I will carry out my function of perfecting the saints, the people of God, equipping them for the work of ministry. What I'm saying is that I will teach you and you will really, 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 really be taught. <laughs> Amen. That's my job. And I, I don't have plan to fail. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't have plan to fail. But you see, it takes two to tango, right? Have you heard it before? Look at me. It takes two to what? Tango. This activity is not one that can be done by one party. Right? There is the church and there is the ministry gift, right? Uh -huh. The ministry gift makes no sense if there is no church. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then there, the, what is the purpose of the church if there is no ministry gift? To shepherd it. To give it direction. To feed it. Do you see that? All right, let's go on. I know it is the truth that there is not much 
that I can do by myself. If you, as the people of God, don't recognize the oppression of God. There is not much I can do. And even the Lord Jesus could not help his own town because they did not see him as the son of God. What did they see? They saw a carpenter. They saw a boy that grew up in the hood. They saw one of the children in the city. They saw a homeboy. He said, it's my town's boy now. We are from the same village. I know his mother. I know his father. Look at it. They saw him as their king's man. Their king's man. They saw a cousin, a nephew. That was what they saw. They did not see the son of God. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? They did not see the son of God. They saw a cousin. They saw a nephew. They saw a village, a villager. They saw a friend in the city. See, They saw a neighbor. Some even saw a son. Some saw brother. That's what they saw. They didn't see the son of God. You see, they didn't see the son of God. And in Mark chapter 6, look at it. Mark chapter 6, I'm going to read from verse 3. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. They took offense at him. Because that was what they saw. They saw, they saw a king's man. They saw someone in the neighborhood. Look at it. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. Look at it. A prophet is without honor, except in his own hometown, in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. Even in his own home. You see. Because there is a barrier, they are seeing a relative. Do you see that? Now? So I'm saying to you, there is not much that I will profit you if you just see me as one of those guys. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's just, just, just that guy. You know, you know, after this now, I'll shake your hand and say, hey, what's up? How are you now? <laughs> and then you, there is a tendency that you will see the guy that said, what's up? Then the one God sent to you. There is a tendency that, for instance, my wife, can, there is a tendency that the only one you see is your husband. Right? And if you see your husband, you see, there is not much God can do to you or for you through him as a minister of the gospel. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. And if I am your friend, there is not much I can do for you because I'm your friend. Do you understand? <laughs> what I can do for you as a friend is limited to being your friend. But what I can do for you as a minister of God is completely different. I can profit you in the service of God, in your service of God. I can profit you in your work with God on this earth. Do you see that now? But it will never happen if you don't see the minister of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you only see your friend, you see your brother, you see your sister. Glory be to Jesus. You know, you can, you can have a minister brother and then you have never asked him to pray for you. Ever. And then, you know, if, if prayer is not solicited for <laughs> except that you are praying, you know, the prayers that, we, you know, we pray for people and we just do that generally. We pray for people. But, you know, you can be going through a lot and you did not at any point say, can you pray specifically for me in this regard? Do you see that now? You can be, you can have the tree right in your compound and you never eat of the oranges, you know, that come, or the fruits that come from the tree. Because you take it for granted that it is there. It's in our house. We have it in abundance. You know, there is, a, there is an orange tree in our compound. And for many years in that compound, we did not drink it. Of the orange. 
for many, many years. <laughs> we were there, we did not drink it. Until a year or two ago. <laughs> and you know people that come and work for us in the compound, they will pluck, when they are leaving, they will pluck it and put it in sacks and take it away. Take the oranges away. And we were there, not, <laughs> not eating it. Until some point, we, I just looked at it. Like, These oranges are there now. I just, I sucked one one day and I saw that it was very sweet. Eh, eh. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. So I called guys, say, hey, come, climb this tree, pluck all the oranges for me. <laughs> and I pack it and put it inside the house. You know, of course, I give some out too. Glory be to Jesus. So you can be near the stuff and not enjoy it because you despise it. Because you have taken it for granted. It is always there. Do you see that now? Okay. That was exactly how they treated Jesus. And even though the Son of God, God in the flesh, you know when we say Son of God, God in the flesh, was there in their midst. You know, ordinarily, ordinarily, you would think that in that city, there should be no, there should be no infidel. No one that does not believe. No one that is sick. No one that is oppressed of the devil. Why? The Son of God was right there. This one is not that he's visiting us. He's a son, like you say, of the soil. He came from there. Ah, Jesus, we will not let you go until everybody in this city is healed. You are not going anywhere. But instead of see the Son of God, the miracle worker, see the power of God in human flesh, they saw a cousin. They saw a neighbor. May, may that not be your own lot. Amen. Look at it. So he, the Bible says he could not do any, mirac any miracles there except lay his hand on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. I just read Mark chapter 6 verse 3 to 6. Alright. So what you see when you see me is really up to you. What you see... When you see me, is what? Up to you. Do you see the man of God? Or do you see Femi? My guy. Right? Say, hey, Femoski. You know, you, you, know they are, they, <laughs> you know, we have mates, colleagues, friends, people that we have known over the years. You know, they will still see you on the street. They say, hey, Femoski. They shake you like bubble. Say, Femoski, what's going on? You see. And if that is what you see, you may not be able to benefit from the man of God. Hallelujah. All right. So, it is largely up to you. Of course, I hate the image by what I project, okay? But it is largely up to you. But I am determined to be what God has intended for me to be. And not just because of me but for your sakes also. I want to be what God intends for me to be for my own sake. And not just for my sake, but for your own sake too. Because I want to be, I want to, I want, I want to profit you to the highest possible means that is available. To the highest possible level that is available. I want to be that profit to you. I want to be able to make that impact maximum impact in your life the way that God has intended for it to be and for me to be able to do that I need your cooperation we have to be on the same page hallelujah so I am not the Lord you know that, <laughs> right? <laughs> because I am also serving the Lord. Okay? I am not the Lord. I am also serving the Lord. But one thing is clear. I am sent by him. What did I say? I am sent by him. I have his mandate to be his gift to you. What did I say? I have God's mandate to be his gift to you. He sent me to you. I 
And what did he tell me? He told me to raise believers. Believers who will walk in the knowledge, power, and glory of the man in Christ. That was what God told me. He says, I want you to raise believers in the knowledge, power, and glory of the man in Christ. Hallelujah. And by the grace of God, we will do it. Amen. God's mandate is very clear. He says, raise believers in the knowledge, power, and glory of the man in Christ. I am determined to do it. Amen. And I know I have the supply of the spirit of Jesus. I believe I am equipped with his grace to do it. And I'm ready to put in the labor for it. But it takes the two of us to get it done. Me as God's gift to you and you as the people of God. I can't do it alone, right? You have to, rem you have to continue to be the people of God, right? And I have to continue to be the God's gift to the people. So it takes two to get it done. You, the people of God, high as God's minister, God's gift. So I am inviting you. Now, this is me telling you that I'm inviting you to come on this journey. Let's go together. Let's go on this journey together. This is a walk. This is, a, this is an operation of God. Let's go on this journey together. I'm telling you now. Let's do it together. Let's do it. It's possible. It is in my hand. It is in your hand. It is in my hand. It's in your hand. I know it's, what I'm asking of you is very tough. No, I, I'm not looking at it just ordinarily. But I want you to take, make a decision. To commit to, to, commit to this journey. I want you to make a decision to commit to this journey. I want you to build your life around this mandate. Arrange your life around it. I can assure you, the future is very bright. The future is very bright. And that is not to mean that we will not face challenges on the way. Right? Uh -huh. We will face challenges on our part. But the Lord will yet be with us. Amen. I don't know if you agree that the Lord will yet be with us. The Lord will yet be with us. Look at Matthew chapter 28 verse 20. And teaching them to obey. This is the Lord speaking. He says, teaching them. He's telling, he says to his men, go into the world. Make disciples of all nations. So he says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we are confident. I am very confident of God's presence with us. The, the, Bible, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he is present there. We are not invoking his presence. Our gathering is an invocation. We don't need to say anything to invoke his presence. Just gathering together in his name is the invocation. So when Christians come together, what we are doing is invoking the presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God. So we are confident that the Lord will yet be with us. Alright. So if we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 or 2 Corinthians chapter 8 okay verse 1 what's the it? Moreover, brethren, we do you to with the, of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. What did we see in this church? 
the grace of God. Are you here? I want you to balance between listening to me and writing your notes. <laughs> I want you to have a fine balance. I, you write your notes because, the, the, you know, the church is a school. You learn. And when you learn, you take notes, okay? Now, so I, I want you to take your notes. But I want you to have a fine balance, okay? Now, what we see present, Paul says, what, we, what he's about to describe about the Macedonian churches it says, is an oppression of the grace of God. An oppression of the grace of God. Look at it. To wit of the grace of God bestowed. You know, it, it, you know it's, a, it's, it's an endowment. That is why they can function seamlessly in it because it was an endowment. See, great affliction, the joy. Deep poverty, but yet liberal. You know, contradictions. But how are they able to manifest the spirit of joy in spite of their great affliction? Because the grace of God was upon them. How were they able to exhibit the riches of their liberality? Because even though they were deep in poverty, because the grace of God functioned over their lives. Now, so, Paul's testimony of the grace of God given to the Macedonian churches will resonate among us in years to come. See, you know, there are things that people will see with what God is going to do with us because we yield to his service. We devote ourselves to the cause. You see, Years from now, people will look back and speak about it and say, that was the grace of God. Amen. That, oh, that certainly is the grace of God. Because there is no way it could have been done. And, and you see, the word that you brought forth yesterday, I'm talking to you, Demiji, you see how, how relevant it is in a, in, in a, in a, in a moment. Because, you know, it, it was as though the Holy Spirit um, um, exposed um, what I was going to share today, you know, what you said yesterday, and it was very on point. Very, very on point. It struck my wife asked me this morning, What hymn are we singing? I said, It's covert <laughs> because you know, I said, It's covert, just leave it. When we get to the service, everything will unfold. Hallelujah! So, we see, I want you to pay attention. Everything we are going, that we are doing, or that we'll be doing. Don't just take it with mere levity. Don't just go, it, go through it as motions of life. Don't just go through it as one of the things that we have to do. You know, you know applying just mechanical forces. Eh, they said we should do it. Let's just do it. No! See everything that we're going to be doing as God's work. An oppression of God. Hallelujah. We'll be able to say, just like others will testify of the grace of God given to us. It will be evident in our worship of God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our unrivaled devotion to the Lord Jesus. And it will be manifestly seen in our selflessness within, that is within the church and outside. You know, Christianity is about selflessness. Christ came into the world to save sinners. He came into this world to save sinners. He didn't come for himself. He came for the world. And in fact, if you read this passage, um, look at it. Verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For ye know, ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And it's, un it's unfortunate that people have reduced this verse to money. It's unfortunate. It is just describing the entire ministry of Jesus Christ in a nutshell. How can you leave your glory at the right hand of... How, how do you leave your glory... You know, in, in John chapter 17, Jesus was praying and he asked the Father. He says, give me the same glory that I had with you before the world began. Because there is really nothing higher 
to aspire to. Don't forget, he came from the bosom of the father, right? Uh -huh. So what can he become other than that? That is bigger than that. Glorify me with the same glory that I had with you before the world began. That was what he wanted from God. So what God gave him, glorious, no doubt, he gave him a name. He says that everything in heaven heart and under the heart answers to. You see. So he did it for our sake. He came for our sake. So he says he left the riches of his office, of his eye calling, being with God. He left it to take on humanity, to wear humanity as garments. The Bible says he was found among men, made little lower than angels. Do you see that? One? That was where he was found. He did it because of us. And the Bible says he became poor. He stripped himself poor for our sakes. So that out of that poverty that he experienced, we might be made rich, made rich. So today, we are called the children of God. Why? Because of who? Christ. So he became poor so that we can become rich. He's not talking about money. He's talking about Christ stripping himself of his divine attributes to go through the suffering of death for us so that through that suffering, we can emerge the children of God. And the Bible says, now are we the sons of God. Hallelujah. So is that very clear? So in the coming days, it is going to be, it is going to be evident. And we are going to manifest this life in Christ in our selfless service to God and to saints and to the world beyond. One example in the Old Testament, and it stands out. The Bible says David anointed a king, <laughs> but he had no manifest presence of a king. You know, he was a, you know <laughs> if you read his story, a, a rudy boy, fine boy. But, you know, it's like when you have gem that is in the mud. You don't appreciate its, its true beauty because it is still in dirt. Right? So he was that fine boy, shepherd in the back of town, always going in desert places or in the wilderness looking after his father's flock. Alone. His brothers were more or less bobos and they were always in the city enjoying themselves. They left it. You know, typically, the last born is the one that stays at home and all the older ones will go out and work. In his own case, the elders would stay in town and he would go until they went for battle. A battle that they did not participate at all. So he was the one that was, eventually he was anointed king, but there was nothing comely about him that announced him to be the king. In fact, for the sake of, you know, pre preserving Samuel's life, he anointed him secretly. He could not even do it in the open. So only his father and his brothers that were there knew that this is the Lord's king. The one that God has chosen to be king. Only his brothers and his father knew that. No other person knew. And Samuel, that anointed him. <laughs> so imagine that. This is the king. He goes around town. After that, after the anointing, he goes around town. He's the king. But then, he has no paranophilia of state. And he has no presence as a king. Yet, anointed king. And you know, when they anointed him king, his office began immediately. Spiritually. You know, he uh, he is. You see, he's not waiting. Mm -mm. He became king immediately. In fact, you know, Samuel was sympathetic to Saul. He did not want... You see, God says, I have moved beyond Saul. I have moved beyond Saul. I'm not someone else. As king, I have moved beyond Saul. You see, Samuel was sympathetic to Saul. He did not want to anoint another king. God says, no, 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 no. Yeah, go to Samuel's... Uh, to um, uh, Jesse's house. I have, a, I have someone there. You see. But there was nothing obvious, even though he was ordained the king. There was no manifest presence. And of course, he lacked the resources and paraphernalia of states. Saul was the reigning king, right? Do you know, you know the story? 
and he was the one that controlled state resources, but without the anointing. Oh, so do you see the difference? Eh? David, the man with the anointing, but lacked state paraphernalia, right? Saul, the king, controlled state, state resources, but without the anointing. I want you to follow. Now, the reigning king controlled state resources, but without the anointing. He knew who the anointed was. Of, of course, eventually, he found out that David is now the new king. Okay? Um, but, you know, normally, just like John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. And every time John was asked, are you the Messiah? He would deny it and say, no, I am not the Messiah. I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. He will always say, my ministry is to unveil him. And when Christ came, and they, kept, they still kept ask, asking him the question, he says, look, eh? he must increase and I must decrease. Because he understood his ministry. That I am here, a forerunner to him. He is the real deal. I am serving him. You know, sometimes you wonder whether his ministry decreased. Really, <laughs> you wonder because he started criticizing state apparatus. <laughs> he was the king and he was thrown into the prison. Well, maybe that was how it was meant to go. Glory be to Jesus. Now, look at it. So instead of preserving the anointed king, he wanted to kill him. In fact, his, his own son, Saul's son, Jonathan, was a friend to David. And he was instigating Jonathan against David. Don't you know that as long as this guy is alive, you are going to be threatened. You are never going to become king. You know, before, before, you know it took even Samuel time to accept the fact that he needed to anoint another person as king. So, everybody had loyalty for the reigning king. Of course, for the most part. But the king they had loyalty to was the one that lacked the anointing. And because David was not ready to take a position against the king on the throne, even though he's the one that lacked the anointing, the king on the throne lacked the anointing, he did not want to move against him to consolidate his power. No, he did not do that. What did he do? He moved out of town. Eventually, of course, Saul was also frustrating him, so he left town. Moved to the, you know, outskirts. Sometimes even in another, to, an, to other countries, so that he could just survive. So he ran for his life, and sometimes for his safety, he ran to enemy nations. Fleeing, when they also hatched plans to kill him. Like there was a time he had to pretend as if he was mad to escape the king. Is it, is it Dweg or whatever? The king, the king of Gats. He had to pretend as though he was mad. So he ran away. So that they would not kill him. The anointed one. Look at it. And in the midst of all of this, there were people who recognized the hand of God on David's life. Some people recognized it. In spite of all the predicaments around him, Oh, he doesn't even have wealth to pursue power. Oh, he was just a young man finding his level. In, you know, the economy was tough just like it was tough, tough on every other one. He was, in the, he was always in the field looking after his father's flock. He was so hardworking, doing whatever he had to do to survive. And in fact, at some point, he became bodyguards. You know, the area he went to, that was how he met Abigail. That eventually married. Nabal's wife. You see. Or Nabal's former wife. You see. He was performing. He was, you know, he was doing bodyguard work. He would protect, you know, because he was in that area. And he was a warrior. He would protect the area. So that rampaging, rampaging robbers would not steal their flock. And then, out of appreciation, people would give him gifts. That, and that was how he survived. Look at it. That was how he survived. The man that was anointed. The one who had the anointing upon his life.
but some people recognize this grace. It may not yet appear to have the gravitas of glory, but it was there. The glory was there. It may not be that conspicuous, but it was there. They recognized it. And they banded themselves together with David, living and walking in the suburbs. So they left the city for the king. They went to the suburbs. They were living in the corner of town. The king go, the anointed one. So, you see, we, we may be in the obscure part of city now. We, we are not known. Nobody knows us. In fact, we don't even have a landmark. You know? But it doesn't really matter. The work of God is going on in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are few, but we are mighty. Hallelujah. In God, we are few, but we are mighty. See, God has used to, to put to flight armies of thousands. Hallelujah. And if he has done it before, he will do it again. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter 2, chapter 22 rather. First Samuel chapter 22. Verse 1 and 2. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and fathers, or his father's household, heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress, or in debt, or discontented, gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Can you see the difference between the people of Jesus' town and the people of David's zone, right? His, fa- his, his brothers who despised him at the war fronts when they were facing Goliath, right? And his father's household, they heard that David is now in this area of town. All of them migrated to the place. And several other people, he said, the people that went to David, look at the qualification of people that went to David. And this is what you were saying yesterday, Dimitri. All those who were in distress, they were in debt, discontented, and they gathered themselves around David. And David became a commander. Can you imagine being a commander of, you know, debtors, <laughs> debtors, debtors. <laughs> people in distress, discontented people. Can you imagine half of a population want to japa? <laughs> I'm not saying that's our own reality. I'm just saying, just imagine it. So you are under constant threat that who is going to go next? <laughs> They are not doing well. And the country is terrible. Everything is hard. So he became the commander of discontented people. You know, the students are not doing well in school. All of them, they banded together with David. Everyone. All the ones that their market was not selling. All of them went to David. All the farmers whose crops were not growing well. Everybody went to David. All the shepherds that... Thieves who are coming to raid their flock. Everybody went to David. The king, the anointed one, became a commander of just 400 people. The king of the town, of, of the nation. The nation Israel. God's people, the Lord's heritage. But it was reduced to shepherding discontented people. Distressed people. People in debt. That was what it was reduced to. Just 400 of them. With all the anointing. With all the anointing. So at this point in David's life, what do you think was was going through his mind? Is this what the anointing can deliver for me? Is this how far the anointing can take me? But I bet you David did not think like that. Eh? David did not think like that. And we will not think like that too. Yes, sir. So, when I see you, I, I don't even know whether somebody is in debt, but I don't see debtors. 
It doesn't matter your present state. It really doesn't matter. Don't we look alike? You see? It doesn't matter what level you are in. It doesn't matter what I'm struggling with. One thing is certain. The work of God is going on in our lives. That is what counts. People may not yet see it today. But we don't need people to believe it. We only need ourselves to believe it. We don't need people to believe it. We don't need people to believe us. We just need to believe our God. That his work is certainly going on among us. Glory be to Jesus. So is it, isn't it strange? The kind of people who joined David. The anointed one. Everyday people with severe life problems. The high and the mighty stay with the king without the anointing. But the one who had state power. See, everybody functions. They want to associate with the one that has the real power. <laughs> the physical power. They don't want to relate with the one that has the anointing. Because there was nothing comely about him that showed the anointing was present. Look at it. These everyday people recognize the grace of God on David's life. Though there was nothing comely about him to serve with him. I'll send you my notes. Okay? Uh, the wit is actually in brackets. <clears throat> you know, so you could read it as to serve him. But as people in Christ, I prefer to say to serve with him. Okay? Now, in the process of time, Saul died. David ascended the throne and consolidated his power. The glory became visible to all. State power was acquired. And the nation submitted to him. And the enemies around surrendered. In the process of time, it happened. It took time, but it happened. It didn't leave his men behind. They grew also. David did not just, you know, become the high and the mighty in the society and all by himself. As he was growing, his men grew alongside him. And the Bible tells us they became David's mighty men. We need to read this one. Second, Second Samuel verse 23. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's a fairly long passage. But we can read um, a part of it. Second Samuel, I'm going to read chapter 23. Did I say chapter 8 before? Okay. Chapter 23, I'm going to read from verse 8. Second Samuel, verse 23. Aha! Uh -huh. Look at verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The tact the tact moon knight that sat at the seat or in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, the S knight. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. Look at how mighty the people that were de described as in debt, are you following what I'm saying? In, they were in debt, right? Discontented, discontented. What's the third one? In debt, discontented. How can I forget now? It's like it flew over, <laughs> over my head. What did I call it for you now? You, you have forgotten. In distress, thank you. They were in distress, in debt, and what? Discontented. Look at it. One of them is highlighted here. It says, one in one fell soup killed 800 people in battle. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Hawite. One of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. 
the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Do you understand what he just said? This guy took his sword, went after the enemies, not regarding their number, not regarding their fortress. He went after them. He fought to the point that the sword was stuck in his hands. Nobody helped him. The people only came out after he had finished the battle. They only came out to take the spoil. These are men that David raised. Mighty men who don't run away from battle. They see the battle to its conclusive end. Are you following what I'm saying? And God is making us those kind of mighty men. It is the work of God that is going to do among us. The same people in distress, in debt, in discontent, the same people will become these mighty men. Mighty men of valor for our God. You can read the rest of the story. So many other ones. Look at this. Look at the one in verse 16. Look at the one in verse 16. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem and that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it. He would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is, is not this the blood of men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. Who are these three mighty men? Look at it. Verse 11. Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. And Philistines were gathered together in a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils and the people fled from the Philistines. But this man with his troop, three of them, they went. David told them that he wanted to drink water. You see. From a particular pool. And these three men went through the camp of the Philistines. Got to that pool and brought that water. Particular water that David wanted. And then they came back through the the camp of the Philistines again. And David got the water and said, no, this water is the blood of men. I will not drink it. And he poured the water before the Lord as an offering. Can you do that? Now, you may not be able to do it. But the you that we emerge will be the one that will not run from battle. In this church, they will not say, ah, they brought somebody that is sick, go and bring a pastor. No, the available person, it doesn't matter who the person is, the available person will lay hands and heal the sick. Amen. Raise the dead. Amen. Cast out devils. Amen. That is what our experience is going to be. Amen. I, I'm not here to raise a church that is go and call the pastor, go and call the pastor, go and call the pastor. No. The church that God wants us to raise is a church that is full of believers who are conscious of the knowledge and the power and the glory of the man in Christ. So every one of us will live in the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, you have the same, you know, similar story. Jesus, our Lord, without education and with, with his largely uneducated apostles. You know, some of them were fishermen, Right? There were other ones, tax collectors. I don't know if tax collectors can rank as illiterates, but there were tax collectors among them. And others with no, no, no particular sense of direction. They took Judea by storm. In a few years, they had gone around the, 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 you know, the nation, bringing the gospel of the kingdom and healing the sick, delivering the captives, setting the oppressed free. In a few years. They, but these people trusted the Lord who called them into ministry. Because he promised them they would become 
fishers of men. That was what he promised them. Look at it, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Come, follow me. I will send you out. Look at, uh, look at their response. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee. Preparing their nets, Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boats or the boats and their father and followed him. They followed. Look at it, 2,000 years after. Eh? A huge population of people, including the highly educated, have trusted that message that they preached for their eternity. Isn't that the case? 2,000 years after. Many generations have come and gone since then. And so many people have believed. Those illiterate boys from Judea and a lot of highly educated people are trusting in their message today for their eternity. Look at it. Let's read a few passages and then we we'll close. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if I had, had 10,000 guardians, in, even if you, sorry, I'm sorry, let me take that again. I am writing this not to shame you, but warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. I urge you to follow me. Are you, are you following what I'm saying to you? He's asking them, I want you, he's telling the Corinthians, I want you to follow me. Follow my example. Look at chapter 11, same book, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So it's not a blind follow, right? You only follow a man that is in Christ. Do you follow what I'm saying? The one who has been so called and ordained for that ministry. Philippians chapter 3 verse 17. Philippians 3 verse 17. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Ghost. Can you see? You became followers of us and of the Lord. Do you see? So they didn't just follow the Lord, they followed his men also. Do you see that now? And your following the Lord is seen in your following of his men. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea. Followers, that's what it is. Followers of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people. The same things those churches suffered from the Jews. Can you see? They followed the churches in Judea. They, they confessed Christ the same way the churches in Judea did. Regardless of the suffering they encountered in the hands of their own people. Just like the churches in Judea suffered from the Jews. But they still followed a good example. Do you see that now? So we follow good example. Do you get what I'm saying now? Uh -huh. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. From verse 7. For you yourselves know how you are to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves 
a model, as a model for you to imitate. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So, what I'm basically asking you is to follow me. What I'm asking you is to trust me, right? Um, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to trust me because I have this capacity you can trust in. I'm asking you to do that because of the mandate of God that he has committed to my trust. Are you following what I'm saying? So, if you repose, I mean, the trust you repose in me, if you choose to, and I hope you will, I will never betray it. This is my own commitment. I will never betray it. And I will never take advantage of you. Now, I cannot offer you guarantees that I will be right all the time. This is me being honest. I cannot offer you guarantees that I will be right all the time. Though, that is my intention. To be correct, to be correct 100% at all times. But if I fall short, it will never be lack of sincerity. It will never be the lack of sincerity. Or it will never be because I want to deceive you. Did you hear me? I'm saying, if I fall short, eh, I don't intend to be. But, it will never be because I want to deceive you. It never, ever be because I want to deceive you. The outcome, I promise you, will be nothing short of remarkable as in the examples that I read to you. The example of David and the example of our Lord. You know, those disciples of Jesus Christ ended up becoming mighty men too. Don't you think so? Look at the, look at the, look at the book that Paul, Peter wrote, an illiterate man. Can you ever say an illiterate wrote that book? Eh? You look at his choice of words. Can you ever in this life say an illiterate wrote that one? And all of us that went to school now, we are studying it. Oh, the Biwada, we must study it. Don't you get it? We have to study it. Our life depends on it. But it was written by an illiterate. But an illiterate with the anointing. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. So the anointing makes a difference. I hope you know, the anointing makes a whole lot of difference. Alright. If you are in on this one, that is you are sold on to this work, the work of God. Now, I want you, now, not, not now, but I want you to, I, I would like to hear from you, because I want you to concur. And I want to take account of your submission. Now, the commitment is not without responsibility. And I would like you to resp no, I'm, I'm, I would like you to respond because you are taking up a commitment too. I'm committing to the work of God. You are committing to also be part of it. And if you commit to it, it comes with responsibility, right? But I will not handle the responsibility now. I will take the responsibility later. Do you understand what I'm saying? It comes with responsibility. Leaders must know how to lead. But those who follow must learn how to also follow. And don't forget, followers grow into leaders. The Bible says those who desire the office of a bishop, they desire a good work. You may not be called into the office, but as a function of your service, you can grow into the office. And it is so honorable, the same way as though you are called by God into the office. Do you understand what I'm saying? In fact, the fact that you are ordained for that office is a calling of God. Do you see that now? And we are going to do it together. Because God is going to help us. Did I hear somebody say, Amen? Amen. I said, God is going to help us. Amen. And together, we are going to take the battle to the gate of the enemy. Amen. God has given us the mandate to raise believers for him. That's the, that's the job. Those, not just people that are part of the numbers. No. People who are conscious, who know God. They know the Lord. They know his power. 
and the glory is evident in their lives. And that will be our experience by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, I am looking forward to that future when we are going to account not just us, people who see us. We account for the grace of God upon our lives. Because it will be so evident that there is the orchestration of God, the operation of God in our midst. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But one thing is certain. Get ready. People will call you Mumu. I hope you know. Say, ah. You are following that small boy. You know, people will say stuff to you. But believe you me, the power of God is still going to be evident in your life. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, this morning I ask you. The Bible says, the race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. Our favor to the men of skill. But we put our trust in you. That for the grace that you bestow, we will labor effectively. And our labor will not be in vain. Your grace will be evident in our lives. And our life in service of you will magnify your holy name. Thank you, eternal Father. Father, you can count on it. We will not disappoint you. We will never disappoint you. By the supply of your spirit, we will never disappoint you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, eternal Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Say amen.